when one comic book owner was sued for selling a ma'a, uh, because it was considered to be explicit, this directly led to the formation of the Comic Book Legal Defense Fund, which is still running today and protecting freedom of expression through comic books. But it wasn't considered a furry APA at all. So perhaps further on to the furry is in the 1980s, at one of the science conventions, uh, Steve Galaki submitted a painting of Irma Fellner, you can see over here, who was an anthropomorphic cat in a science fiction universe. And this character, you know, it started a whole discussion with people that were in attendance about the place of anthropomorphics in science fiction and why someone would like characters like that. And this group then, of course, has also met up uh, at later conventions. So it created maybe the first uh, aspect of the furry fandom. And Uma Fellner was later published in uh, Steve Galaki's Alvida Anthropomorphics APA. So we've got obviously, you know, there was early this funny animal APA, we've got this discussion about anthropomorphics going on in the comic book fandom, and then after Footy was discontinued, a year later, Raoul Brazel uh, was formed. And this is far more explicitly furry, and later obviously it did become uh, mentioned, started using the term furry. And in terms of furry history, it's often been described as the first sign of the furry fandom. I mean, Fred Patton has said that himself. But he is also a bit biased, as he was for, I think, 16 years the editor of Ralph Brazel. So he obviously will want to uh, increase its uh, renown. But Perry Rhodes has said, in contrast, that Ralph Brazel was a lot more exclusive than it perhaps should have been. It was only really available to contributors to the magazine, and because of this, it was never able to really represent or uh, lead to the development of anything in the furry fandom. But then, uh, still, we're still going to just these science fiction com uh, conventions, and Rod O'Reilly and Mark Molino, uh, Rod O'Reilly's still quite active, he's running the Inflammation uh, blog at the moment, uh, I'm not entirely sure what Mark Molino is doing, but the two of them, they started this um, uh, room party at a science fiction uh, convention for people who were fans of funny animals. And that was, you know, there were a couple of people who went to that. The next year they decided, okay, it went well, we'll make it an official party. But they handed out flyers that were saying, come to our furry party. And this seems to be the first time that furry was actually used instead of the funny animal terminology. And that, of course, later led to this interest in anthropomorphics being called the furry fandom. Not content with just having a room party, again, Rod O'Reilly and Mark Molina, they started in 1989 Conference Zero, which was really a trial run to see whether they could have a conference just for people who were interested in the furry fandom. And so that was attended by about 65 attendees, and it went on for a while, unfortunately ending in, with conference 2003, which is the year it was held, not the number of conferences that had actually occurred. <laughs> and yeah, so there was some discussion about why that ended, but the important thing is now, last month was Anthrocon 2015, which had 6,348 attendees, about 1,500 fur suitors, and a predicted impact on Pittsburgh's economy of $5.7 million. So it's now become a massive thing. <laughs> I'm sure you know, I mean, even here we've got, I think it's 2,100 and something furs for Europeans. And these are obviously not the only two, there are multiple conventions all over the world. And it's grown quite a bit. But the 1990s was also the beginning of the internet. Well, not quite the beginning, but we'll say the beginning. And that was when FurryMuck and the user group old.fan.furry were founded. FurryMuck is, as far as I know, still growing and the oldest running muck in the world. So congratulations, furries. In 1992 or so was when the World Wide Web was actually launched. So before that, it was other client services and more text-based, uh, more text-based internet, really. But as you know, most of us probably found the fandom 
a little bit after that, or I certainly did anyway. And it started then with sites like VCL, which was launched in 1994, still running, although I'm not sure anyone's actively using it because it has multiple deficiencies. But the main ones that are still going is obviously Yifstar, which was originally done there as the Yiffy Story Archive. Per Affinity launched in 2005, which is probably everyone knows about it, and it's the biggest site at the moment. Unfortunately, it has quite a few issues and was recently sold out of the fandom and is now, and is now owned by Imbu. And there seems to be some drama regarding the forum as well, but we'll leave that. Uh, later on, due to an expansion in the content that Yifstar was, uh, was hosting, not just it moved on to art, but also into all levels of content, it was decided to rebrand the site in a totally new direction, and it became Sofari. A year after that, Green Reaper was not... No, you weren't owner then. Mm -hmm. You only came later. I, I joined at that time, but I wasn't... Joined at that time. Okay, well, Ink Bunny then started a year later. Now Green Reaper runs it. And the latest one to join is Weasel, which, of course, these four are now the main sites that everyone's probably on at least one of those. Is there anyone that isn't on? No, everyone's on at least one of those. So we've seen the furry fandom has grown just from an interest in this anthropomorphics. You know, it's been used as a metaphor, became as funny animals, and now we call it furry. But you want to know exactly what is furry and why is that important? And here I will say, a few people have done this before, and there's the risk of, of course, going into this XKCD situation, where instead of uh, reducing the number of terms, you just add one more. It's unfortunate, but it's a risk we're going to have to take. And I'd say the importance of defining furry, there are a couple of reasons. Firstly, it's nice to be able to say what you're interested in. If you go with this, furry could mean anything, and someone asks you, well, what is furry? And you say, oh, well, I can't really say it's different for each person. Then it sounds like you're holding a whole convention, you've got this interest, but you can't even say what it is you're interested in, which is a problem. Secondly, if you have a good definition, you can avoid a lot of uh, misinterpretation. So obviously, every time the media says something about furries that isn't true, or some aspect is blown out of proportion, Everyone goes around, they're like, no, 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 that's not what furry is actually about. It's not about that, it's not about that. But it's no good just saying it's not something. You want to say this is what it actually is. And that way, if someone gets something wrong, you can say, look, this is really what it's about. It's not all about sex. It's not all about fursuiting, although that's obviously a big part. But the minority of furs have a fursuit. Minor minority of furs have been to a convention. The majority have some sexual interest in it, but... It's not the only reason people are into it. And lastly, it's important that when you're talking about something, you all are speaking about the same thing. So we all understand English, hopefully, or there's some very confused people in the audience. <laughs> but to us, then, you say there's a mansion, that's what you see. It's a large house, many rooms, but the word mansion has also moved over into Japan. However, if you've got a mansion in Japan, it's just a regular apartment could be only one room. So you'd be quite disappointed if you hear, ah, I've got a mansion waiting for me, and that's what you find. <laughs> More seriously, if you hear someone's got a gift for you, well, that's great, everyone wants a gift. But in German, a gift is poison. <laughs> so you don't want them to have a gift for you. And that's why I think it's important that if we're also talking about furry, we know, okay, we're all talking about the same thing. Otherwise, if they'd say, you argue about something, if one person's talking about one definition, another person's another definition, you could maybe agree, but not realize it, because you're talking about a different furry. And lastly, the word is quite confusing, because we apply it to many things. We could say we're all furries, because we're the fans, the characters themselves are furry, and you can say the artwork is furry, because it's got the characters. So, overall, I'd say the most important one here is the characters. They are what everything revolves around. So it's also where I focus most of my attention. So previous definitions, some of them have been good, some of them have been bad. Conference, for example, starts out by saying furry characters aren't necessarily furry, which is great. We know that now. 
we've got dragons who are furs, we all use it as characters. Actually, I'll come back to dragons later. But we've got, you know, scalies, avians, whatever. They don't have fur, but they're furries. However, they later go on to say, furrydom includes everything from your normal, everyday animals, to aliens from outer space, to vampires and werewolves, to cartoon animals, to mythical beasts and dragons, to anthropomorphic animals. Furry can mean many different things to different people, much like the word fantasy. Which sounds nice, except that is a very, very broad definition of furrydom. So, according to them, all of this is furry. Superman's an alien, he would be furry according to the conference <laughs> definition. The snow leopard over here is a normal animal. It would be furry. However, with the more common definition of anthropomorphic animal, we know by definition a normal animal cannot be furry. Dracula is a little bit on the edge there. I don't think many people consider vampires or Dracula furry, but at least he was able to shapeshift into a bat and a wolf, so he's got that going for him. And lastly, the vixen, yeah, we'll all say that's furry. Uh, Jefferson Swikaffer, he wrote in 1994 that the furry fandom is the organized appreciation and dissemination of art and prose regarding furries, which is alright, perhaps a bit too organized for my taste. But then he went on to say furries were fictional mammalian anthropomorphic characters, which obviously, like I said, We've moved beyond that. It's not just mammals. I would say we're limited to just animals, though. Um, some people then would say greater than that is the anthropomorphic fandom. However, it should also be noted most people that say they're in the anthropomorphic fandom, it's just they're trying to distance themselves from any negative connotations of furries. For example, there's an anthropomorphic group on deviant art, which I've been following for I don't know, a couple of years now. And they obviously have this group favorites that pop up, and I don't think I've seen one of them that isn't a furry character. It's not, they're not sharing the brave little toaster or pictures of ants or something like that. So that one's not quite working either. Then there's this identity thing that often comes up, uh, probably best argued by J.M. Horse, where he called the second wave of furry. And then he draws the distinction between the First furries, which were fans of this medium, and then furry lifestylers, which he said took over. And of course he goes on by saying, you know, now uh, new furries tend to take up an animal persona with a new species and a new name by default. And sure, that is quite common. I'm sure everyone here has a persona. However, that's also pretty much the nature of the internet at the moment. Everyone uses an avatar, and that could be even, for example, the Wii has its own name for its knees. Uh, but, so this avatar use, not necessarily furry. Secondly, with the identity aspect, you can make it a bit tautological. You don't want to be saying, people are furries because they identify as furries. But it doesn't make sense. You'd have to say, why are they identifying as furries? What is this common thing that brings them together? Once you've got that, you don't need them to identify, you can just say, okay, they have this interest in whatever, they're furries, even if they want to deny it. It's, you know, you can't deny I'm, you know, a, a, let's say a soccer player because you're not in a team. Even if you're kicking the ball around with your friends, you know, that's, well, not a professional soccer player, but you play soccer. Um, then, slightly with the identity, there's a bit of a risk of conflating furries with Therians and other kin. There's obviously an overlap, and the Therians and Underkin are quite involved in the fandom, but it's also not exactly the same thing. And lastly, some artists will, who are not furry will represent themselves in their work as an anthropomorphic character. Uh, with the rise of the Brony fandom, they often used original characters to represent themselves as well, as you can see two over there. And some people would obviously say it's furry, some would say not, but it turns out that the Anthropomorphic Research Project interviewed furries at Furry Fiesta 2013, and there are only about 20% of attendees consider themselves bronies. And similarly, in 2014, the State of the Herd, which is a large uh, survey of bronies, also only found about 20% of bronies identifying as furry. 
So again, subcultures do not overlap completely. And lastly, not everyone has an avatar. For example, Fred, who's been involved for the last 40 years with the furry fandom, he never took a furry uh, personality, and he is definitely a fur. I mean, J.M. Horst did say, we're not kicking people out, he's still considered a fur, but it's a bit condescending the way that you say, okay, you know, we'll let you stay. So I'd say, if having an anthropomorphic character does not automatically make you a fur, and lacking this character doesn't mean you're not a fur, then it doesn't serve as a useful, uh, a useful web place to pin your definition. And on a slightly less uh, well-known note, because I only saw it on Adjective Species uh, a few weeks ago, uh, Flip had a guest post there where he talked about uh, the fur modern furry aesthetic. And he says here, the use of anthropomorphism shifted from instinctual and insightful to analogous slash referential as a liter uh, literary device where this paradigm is cultur culturally prominent. Modern furry denotes a subculture where that literary use shifts back. So basically what he said here was any use of furry characters as allegory, for example, Animal Farm, he specifically points out Fritz the Cat or Mouse, would not be furry, simply because they are taking these furry species and using them as an example as a way to represent race, or social class, or something like that. And I would of course completely, completely reject that, and say whether it's furry or not would be judged on the content. Judging it on you know, the use, it has multiple problems, not least of it, art is subjective. So I'm not sure if you've seen, uh, it's a really adorable Korean flash animation, there she is, uh, it's about this anthropomorphic cat, anthropomorphic rabbit, falling in love, and the society says, no cat-rabbit relationships. Now you could obviously look at that without any sort of interpretation, just say, okay, it's a story about a cat and a rabbit where they're not allowed to be together. Of course, you could also say, the cat and the rabbit represent social classes. So for example, like India's caste system, it could be saying, ah, you should get together regardless of your caste. Or it could be about different races. And that, for example, was illegal in South Africa for blacks and whites to marry. I believe also in the US at some point. So maybe they're talking about that. Or maybe it could just be a way of representing homosexuality. Just their, this relationship that is not socially accepted, but they work through it. And the thing is, unless you know what the author intended, it's very hard to interpret this. And it becomes even more difficult if the work is old. So if we found something that you would say is furry from 200 years ago, you don't know what the political situation was. You don't know if that work was intended to be satire of something. And so it makes it very difficult to then say, this is furry, this is not. So let's say that's a poor definition. And this is, of course, the one used by Anthrocon, Wikipedia, and I imagine the majority of people is that furry is just about anthropomorphic characters, which are animal characters with human personalities characteristics. And for the most part, that works really well. However, uh, there are a couple of limitations which I think need to be uh, expanded upon. And so, if I go to my definition, I first say that furry is a mixture of human and animal characteristics. And these pictures over here, which I believe are all by furry artists, come from the werewolf calendar. And the thing here is werewolves are not anthropomorphic wolves. They are humans that have transformed into a wolf through some various mean. So what you have here is not furry, either a wolf or a human, and through some process, either anthropomorphism or zoomorphism, you get the combination, either an anthropomorphic wolf or a werewolf. And depending on your interpretation of werewolf, they can be indistinguishable from one another the starting points and the paths they took to get there are different. Furthermore, I'm going to see we've got a fursuit here. The fursuit character is certainly furry, but underneath that we know there's a human. And it wasn't the character... Uh, was it, in this point, the human putting on the suit is taking on animal characteristics to become furry. And so fursuiting is pretty much a furry-specific thing. I mean, you have mascots, 
but it's not really the same thing. It's certainly not personal characters. And I'd say you wouldn't really want your definition of furry to exclude fursuiters from this mix. So either way, as long as you're mixing the two characters, then I'd say it's furry. The second point, I would say furry requires a non-anthropomorphic starting point. Because certainly if you're going with the uh, original definition, it's an anthropomorphic whatever. If they, that something is already anthropomorphic, you can't add to it. For example, if you've got a fox, you can give it human arms and legs. If you've got a chimpanzee, it just doesn't work. But you don't consider a chimpanzee to be anthropomorphic just because it's got arms and legs. That's how it is. So this is a Pokemon character, Lucario, which is inspired by a jackal, but it's not just an anthropomorphic jackal. And it's also not something that you can anthropomorphize much further. In one of the Pokemon movies, it was shown to be highly intelligent already, although I don't believe it could actually talk. But its body shape is human, so there's not much you can do. So I wouldn't say it's actually furry. That's different for some other Pokemon. So Pikachu or Growlithe can both be made furry, quite simply, <laughs> just like a normal animal. And maybe a bone of contention is dragons, you have a certain similar issue with dragons are not real. So you'd have, you'll have many interpretations of what dragons are like. For example, Chinese dragons, you've got European dragons, and you've got more modern ones such as Toothless, who's highly intelligent but can't talk, or Smaug from The Hobbit, who's highly intelligent and can speak. Incidentally, J.R.R. Tolkien, who's often just considered to be a UK author, was born in Bloemfontein in South Africa. So it's just something to keep in mind so it's not stolen away and considered to be a UK thing. But with dragons not being real, you don't have a non-anthropomorphic form. Toothless is the canon non-anthropomorphic form for the how I made, uh, how, you, <laughs> how, I, how to train your dragon, um, the universe. So in that case, I would consider dragons to be furry related rather than true furry, which of course might upset some people, but I want to make a few points there. Firstly, because I'm not considering identity to be a criteria for furry, that doesn't mean anyone with a dragon persona is not furry. The character is separate from if someone is furry. And secondly, things like dragons, Pokemon, Therians are obviously very much furry related, and so they would certainly surround furry, obviously welcome in the furry community. And, you know, the borders between what is furry, what is furry related, and what's not furry are porous. That's why I've got them as dots here. Even if you go to animals, most furries have a affinity towards animals, most furry artists draw non-anthropomorphic animals, it's a big thing. We, some people might say, and of course they have told me before, that it's too much shades of grey, you know, it's a continuum, and that's true. Uh, you might even take, and uh, there was a, another essay on adjective species about post-furry, which happened to be these, uh, let's say a vixen that was actually a lava lamp as well. So, you know, it's sort of a strange thing like that, but you'd say there, is it really... Oh, a question? Uh, you have like, a lot of things with the furry section, but... Yes. Yeah, you're talking about human face and animals, and the only thing I can see then is like talking. Yeah. Whereas, for example, if you take the, the 19-something of the Hood movie, those were clothes and walking to each other yeah. speak, and... Oh. Because anthropomorphism doesn't have to be just physical anthropomorphism. So I include the mental anthropomorphism of giving them a higher intelligence, giving them the ability to speak. And so that's what I include. I mean, you could perhaps argue that it should just be physical, but yeah, I certainly, I've been told because my character is a normal guy, but with obviously normal human intelligence and speaking ability, that I'm not a furry because I didn't have a physically anthropomorphic character. And Fred, for example, has also been told, because he doesn't have a persona, he's not a furry either. And I'd say none, none of that matters, partly on the identity, and partly because your human traits are also intelligence and speaking.
In fact, intelligence is perhaps the most important human trait. So, it's arguable anyway. Uh, yeah, so uh, overlap, and on that continuum idea, you get, for example, you know the color spectrum, it flows from one color into another, into another, but we don't struggle to say, okay, there's actually red, blue, green, yellow. Even though at the borders between them, it'll blur, and people might have different ideas which color, is it actually yellow or is it green, but we can recognize certainly in the center that they'll define regions that are green, blue, or red, unless you're colorblind. And lastly, which I'm sure everyone gets, they've probably seen these pictures before as well, is that furry, uh, the furry form should be significantly different from the canon or the real form. Mostly because if you're looking at an anthropomorphic wolf, you've got a human on the one end, which is not furry, a pure wolf on the other end, also not furry, and in between you'll have any sort of combination of them, which could be furry. It's quite difficult to say exactly what point it's furry, but we don't usually draw characters that much on a continuum. It's usually some fixed point. So it's either you know the ears and the tail, like in the Japanese Neko um, pictures, or sometimes you get them, you know, these uh, semi uh, anthro, so uh, four on that scale. And a Ricky Fox has drawn a couple like that, I think it was. Um, but most of them, furry characters, are pretty much about the same level of furry. So to me, that makes furry describing a character possessed of a combination of human and animal traits in such a way that it's significantly different from the real or canon form. Again, it's quite similar to the standard definition, but with a couple of changes that I think are important to be, in some cases, more inclusive, in some cases, slightly less, but with the different layers of true furry, semi furry, you know, I think it covers that fairly well. Uh, that, of course, gives you the rest of the definitions. Fans are obviously people that are fans of those characters, or perhaps some of the related ones. And the artwork is artwork containing those characters. But here is where I want to also bring up furry music. Mostly because it's annoyed me a bit, because the way they use furry music is often quite different to the way you'd say furry artwork. So obviously, there we go, furry artwork, about music. But, I, oh yeah, uh, this is just a term taken from Wikifur. The furry music is a term that is often used to describe music of any particular genre that is either performed by self-described members of the furry fandom or centered around the themes of a furry nature, or both. And the centered around themes of a furry nature is how we would usually uh, describe something as furry. But if you look at these pictures, all by furry artists, and I must admit they do have some relationship to the furry fandom, I'm not going to tell you exactly what, but maybe you know some of them. Um, these we probably wouldn't say are furry pictures. I mean, I'd certainly be disappointed if I went to the art gallery now, and all the pictures were landscapes or, you know, the interior of rooms just drawn by furry artists. And yet, we're quite happy, well, I'm not happy about it, but <laughs> some people are quite happy to say just instrumentals wind up being furry music. And I'll use um, Fox and Moore as an example, because he does some that are considered furry music, some that's not, and he's not likely to, he's big and famous enough not to care if I say anything bad about him. But a lot of his work, at least in the earlier stages, I'm not sure so much now, was instrumental. There was no furriness to it. I mean, there could have been a theme that it wanted to imply something about the furry nature. But if I painted a red canvas and said it's a, a representation of the rage a bull feels when it's about to charge, you probably wouldn't say it's a furry picture. It's got that sort of link but it's just not strong enough. And as another example, if we look at this, it's a scientific paper, you know. Phenol propane amide derivatives as uh, inhibitors of hepatitis B virus replication. Who would consider that to be furry? No one. However, if you notice, the second author is Samuel Conway, the chairman of Anthrocon. So, if just, drawing, uh, if just doing an instrumental music thing is enough to make it furry, because you're a furry, 
then surely him writing a scientific paper should be furry because he's a furry. And if it's not, you need to wonder, why is it not? How come for music, we're also allowing performed by self-described members of the furry fandom? That opens it up to all sorts of complications. So performed is different to written. If a furry sings a song off the radio, does that song become furry? Just for maybe that performance only? And you also got to wonder, is the way they cook furry cooking? Do you do furry commuting or furry cleaning of your house? <laughs> it doesn't make sense. You need to say it's furry because it's got some context. So I'm not sure if you saw that all the single furries music video, which was done, they changed the lyrics, which made it furry. The music video, obviously with fursuits, was furry. Proximal was involved in that, so he's back on his furry music thing. Uh, and there's, there's been many other music videos as well, which you can say are furry, because they have brought some aspect of the furry fandom to it. If you're saying it's only furry because someone who does it is a fur, then you also wonder what happens if they leave the fandom, if they lose their interest. Does that song stay furry because they made it when they were a fur? Does it no longer become furry? Or is it furry when they originally did it, but no longer furry? I would, in this point, I would go with Nice the Singing Dog, who has said, for me personally, if we can properly define furry music as being furry music, I believe that kind of music must contain lyrics and a story about anthropomorphic characters, or contain language that emphasizes with the furry community. So for example, Kama Sea Foxes, uh, the, wolf in, the Wolf in Me, or The Wolf in You, uh, or something like that. <coughs> that, I would say, is definitely furry music. However, Fox and Moore and Colson did a really beautiful cover of Hallelujah, but I would not consider it to be furry music. So, in conclusion, furry has been, in some form, a part of human culture for thousands of years, and it's great that it's now becoming its own uh, separate entity. However, it's only been around like 30, 40 years, and I think with some of these definitions, they're either not completely clear, or they're not used consistently, and I think the fandom still has ways to grow. I mean, my definition, for example, obviously I personally think it's better than the current ones, but I don't think it's perfect. I know there are a lot of places where it just does not work, and at the moment I don't know a way to fix it, but I still prefer it over other ones. And so the last point I just want to leave when you're thinking about what is furry, I think it's also helpful to ask, what can you change about that to make it no longer furry? So if you see a picture and you say, is it furry? You can say, yes, there's an anthropomorphic character in it. And if I took that away, it would no longer be a furry picture. But if you're saying, you know, this music is furry because somebody wrote it and they're a furry, there's nothing about the music that you can change that would stop it from being furry. And I think in those situations, it might be the case that you are trying too hard to make something furry, and it shouldn't actually be considered furry. Yes, so thank you for listening, and hopefully it was interesting and entertaining. I'm sure if anyone has any questions, discussions, wants to say I'm an idiot, it's all happened online already, don't worry. <laughs> yeah. ah. So I think one of the issues you might face is that, um, you know, to take that, go back to your example with your mouse, for example, um, the, the author didn't necessarily intend it to be about, like, what I would call the furry condition, yeah. the, the, the fact that they are anthropomorphic characters is purely an artistic device yeah. to distinguish them, rather right. than being about the fact that they are human, you know, they're not yeah. human and they're not animal. But I mean, that, I would say, goes to, uh, was a Flip's definition about you needing to have this certain intention and, you know, whether it's used as a metaphor or not. And I'd say it doesn't really matter if you intended as something furry. I mean, for example, the Disney movies, like Robin Hood, wasn't intended for the furry fandom. But I would still say it's furry because I would judge it based on the content of whatever it is. Uh, yes? Do you recall Utopia? 
Well, I'd, <laughs> I've seen a lot of people saying it's being aimed at furries. I would say it's certainly furry uh, in terms of content. I'm, I wouldn't say it was necessarily made by furries or for the furry fandom. But, you know, like other movies like it, it's furry by content. Yeah, I am quite your definition of made uh, quite a bit of a there, but uh, I think of um, most of the definitions uh, tend to focus a bit too much only on the form. Uh, yeah. this, the psychological aspect of the character, uh, I think, is actually really important because of the whole type of and, uh, and I, I don't think it fully makes a sense to consider, for example, Bugs Bunny a true story. Yeah. Uh, or funny animals uh, are practically easy to distinguish from boys, uh, even without the working definition. Uh, I think that's the biggest support of the definition of fairy robots, for example, that we have so that it wants uh, boys and funny animals to be considered part of the same thing. Yeah. But uh, uh, I mean, if you compare a funny to Lola Bunny, Lola Bunny is certainly much more similar to typical boy character than so uh, I think there are, it needs some like, some other criteria for the over the case. Uh, yeah. I don't know if something which has to do with uh, sexualization or with the charters uh, being more aware of the status or something like that. Something something has to be covered. But I think there is a need to be a bit more precise. Uh, I haven't heard people saying it should be more precise and cutting out more things. That's a first, but. <laughs> Um, not, not many things, but yeah, I would say also remember because furry was coming from this funny animal fandom as well. So there's certainly for a long time we're running in parallel and were the same thing. Uh, we might have now moved so that furry is perhaps separate from how people are using funny animals, and perhaps that was the topic of the talk I couldn't go to yesterday. But I personally wouldn't be supporting excluding funny animals. Um, if you look at the only fandom, it's the funny animals which are pretty well established from Tori. So there must be some, something that would be something. It would need, I suppose, more discussion. Maybe, but, uh, yeah. That just didn't add any mind. The problem here is Tori is not a genre. Yeah. Yeah, Meitan genre. Star Wars, not Tori. Yeah. Chewbacca, Ebooks, Tori. Well, I'd say they fall under alien, no non anthropomorphic forms. Yeah, <laughs> I was going more about the genre here. Yeah. Because we are encompassing so much, it's really hard to differentiate if funny animals are in it or not. Yeah, obviously it does. It's more like, you know, comedy, I suppose, would be a similar thing. It can, you can have comedies with all sorts of other characters, all sorts of other themes. It's, it's not one specific thing. Oh, sorry, the man. When you said that, um, <coughs> especially when it comes to music, yeah. would you actually say that um, it's more the intent of being furry than anything else? As in, you know, someone could draw an ant for a wall, and could that be considered non furry if there was no intent for it to be furry? Now, I would judge it purely on the content, not the intention. So I would also say people that haven't heard of the furry fandom but have that interest. I would still consider them to be furries, even if they don't yet know about it. And so that's where, for example, this identification thing would, you know, would differ, would say, unless they know about the furry fandom and actually say they're furry, they're not furry. But to me, again, it's, it's a separate thing from whether you identify. It's like if you're blonde or something, you're blonde, whether you identify as blonde or not. You could dye your hair, but although your hair does change, but so does your interest in furry stuff. So. Yeah. And intentions are really hard to read. Yeah, that, that is true as well. There was a, you know, I read some of high line visit to the school mm -hmm. where they wrote a book of his. And the teacher came to the conclusion was the book was telling yeah. what, a, what a author, what he wanted to tell. And Hannah said, that is not what I wanted to tell. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So intention is difficult. I had a, I think there was somebody who sent it was, I, I heard something about it, they'd sent the letters to a number of authors whose work was, you know, obviously criticized by all these literary people and they, they bring these metaphors in, like, this character did this because it represents that, and it's like, is this what you intended? And 
majority of those is like, no, I, I didn't mean that. They just, you know, want to interpret something and they read in their own thing, which is obviously a good thing about art. You can read whatever you want into it, but it also means, you know, that's not necessarily true. Uh, I, I do wonder, you know, in these English classes, how much of that is metaphor, or how much is just chance. Yeah. Yeah, but what about classifying other people's stories? As example, the creator of this Comic for Kids um, mm. club, um, the students himself from Curry. He says it's not <coughs> Curry, but he fitted in the rest of music and yeah. also enjoys Curry art. Well, I'll go there. First, you're not necessarily making Curry. It would be if you have that interest, and perhaps it would be a good to say a preference for anthropomorphic characters, let's say, or furry characters then that would mean you're a furry. I mean, regardless of whether you want to call yourself that or not. Like I said, there are many people that I think are furry, and the only reason they don't use the term is because they don't want to be attached to any baggage or drama that might come with it. Okay. But uh, he's got one in the corner. Um, so, you said that even if the author has stated, um, like in the example of uh, two kinds, for example, mm -hmm. to work on uh, whereas two thirds of the cast are anthropomorphic um, Would you say that's a furry comic, even though the author, Tom Fishback, has stated that it's not a furry comic, it's just a fantasy setting with actual animals? Uh, yes, I'd say it's still furry. I mean, if George Lucas came and said Star Wars is not science fiction, you know, it's just set in space, and in the, the past, that's the future, and you know, no one's going to take it seriously. It's science fiction because of what the content is about, not whether he actually calls it that himself. I mean, that's just someone being in denial. <laughs> um, there was another question? Uh, yeah, well, uh, now regarding the, uh, to the identity, um, I, I heard from multiple sources uh, that, uh, for example, Japanese schools usually don't, uh, uh, don't have a persona or don't uh, have yeah. the identity identify themselves with the charters. They usually create charters, but it's uh, much more rare for them to identify with the charters. Ah. So, uh, yes, it's just good to know. <laughs> yeah, uh, in fact, I think it's because that's why the um, process of initial sounds uh, doesn't really work. Because yeah. still go the I mean, there is, I know it's come up before, the Asian, as far as the Asian, basically, furry community is not exactly the same in terms of the structure, and I think partly because of the language difference, there's not too much overlap. I mean, you do find like Japanese artists, or I mean, I watch on Inkbunny, there's um, uh, from Thailand, I think. Um, what's her name now? I can't remember at the moment. But, you know, so you do get some Asian furries involved in, for example, the Western culture, but I think for the most part, they've been separate. So if we talk about furry, we don't have that experience. And it, it would be good to know, but it's it's hard with a huge language gap. Yeah. Oh. So if we're going to judge more on appearance than intent, where does that mean mask up? Some of them are actually very anthropomorphic characteristics, but in the nature of the world, they yeah. consider themselves furry, and others do more, for example, dragons may be borrowing elements from non existent creatures. The mascot one's probably a good point. I could say that some of the characters are certainly would be furry, even if it's not for the furry fandom. I mean, like I said, with the dragons, I put this difference between you know furry furry, as in fitting this sort of mixture of human and animal, and this having a non-anthropomorphic starting point. And then this furry related, which I would, for example, I have that my character basically, that someone drew for me uh, from South Africa, and it's, for example, a Pokemon, and I still would not consider Pokemon itself to be furry, but I would still consider myself to be furry. And certainly Pokemon are quite prevalent in the furry fandom, and it's the same thing, I mean, I wouldn't also consider My Little Pony to be furry. Although I still have an interest in that, and I think it's still it's still important uh, as part of the furry community, which I think can extend a bit further than maybe you might want to define the words. Yeah. Uh, okay. 
depending on the mass cost, I'd say the, the suits or the, the costumes would be good, but you wouldn't need that because they wouldn't they wouldn't look for their uh, preference for it, but simply to stand out as yeah. a market. Yeah, certainly the people but under the costume are not furry. I mean, maybe some of them are, but the majority just do it because it's what they do. I, I was curious about your your assertion that My Little Pony isn't furry. I mean, it's like, how is are you not are you then not judging it on the content? Because clearly there are animals, but they have human yeah, characteristics. Some, see, My Little Pony is one way I think my definition doesn't work very well. Mostly because, for example, unicorns, alicorns, pegasi, none of them are real. So, strictly going by my definition, they're not furry. The normal ponies are furry, or would be furry because they are real. So that's actually the main point where I know it breaks down, because you'd have different characters that are quite similar from the same show, but would be sort of termed differently. So I'm looking at my character, and actually we had trouble defining it, what <laughs> categorization it was on Wikifer, and we had to decide right. it was an alien character. <laughs> it was from another planet, and it was not real, so that's not furry. Under Pretty your much. definition. That's, <laughs> that's going to be fun. Okay, well, let's take because that. Because there's no, you know, you've got no combination of a non anthropomorphic norm. It's sad, but some, somewhere you've got to draw a line anyway. Uh, it just depends where it will be. And I mean, I think that one best keeps, if you're going from the, the most common one, the anthropomorphic whatever, you keep that part of it. Because otherwise, you, again, even if you've got a norm, you've got a dragon. They're not an anthropomorphic dragon because there isn't a non-anthropomorphic dragon. At least that's the way I see it. Some people disagree, some quite a lot. And that, yeah. And any last ones? Okay. Thank you. It was fun.